Let's see if I can find these notes. Photography really has this well-documented ability of turning the ephemeral into something long-lasting. The opportunity to photograph something that is fleeting, ephemeral, that is, you know, an item that lacks longevity, that, that ages, that decomposes. And a photograph can package that at one, one particular moment in time. I want to avoid the term that it freezes the object. But, but in a sense, it... Let's pause there for a minute. I saw the Tony Fair show today at Gordon Robichaux. Today was the last day. And it also happens to be Pride in Manhattan. So it's a really poignant day to go see this exhibit. And I was lucky enough to be the only other person in the show when I went to go see it. I put it off as I put off many things. I wanted to go see the show. I just couldn't make it there. Everything else got in the way. And all of that becomes part of my experience going to the show today. Getting on the train was fantastic because so many people were out and excited and dressed up. And, uh, you know, it is one of those days in New York where the world feels filled with energy. And so when I got off at Union Square, I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see tons and tons more people. Um, the streets were closed off so you could walk through the streets, which always feels nice. And I walked up to 17th Street to, to see the show. I took the elevator up to the ninth floor. And um, I guess I don't want to build, I don't want to build too much meaning into every single moment, but I had seen pictures of the show online and I had seen some pictures of the show that people had posted uh, who, who had visited the exhibit. And... Those photographs don't do any of these artworks justice. And it's interesting because the artworks themselves are so rudimentary. Uh, you know, the word quotidian gets used often with this work. The word ephemeral gets used often with this work. These are objects that are otherwise benign in our lives. As a child, we might relish certain small things like a marble. We can have a collection of marbles or a collection of cards or a collection of bottle caps. And there is a sense to what Tony was doing that is similar to that quality of collecting. The the, the sort of resonance that a small object can carry that to a young, youthful eye feels bigger and it feels special. The way in which a bottle cap might be pressed into shape or the color of the paint on that or the way in which the, the text has been 
printed onto that object. All of these things, you know, create an aura around the object. And it would be, it would be an easy thing to say that that alone is what makes Tony's work, but it doesn't. There's nothing about the work that fetishizes the manufacture of the objects. In fact, it's, it's more about the constant handling of the object and the path that the object is on, the artwork is on towards its complete uh, you know, destruction. Um, in many cases, the objects are cardboard, where, you know, in the case of this show, there's sponge. And these things, you know, over time will disintegrate. I think that there's an effort in photography, not just an effort, but like there's a practice in photography where photographers can use the medium to capture something and to hold on to it. And you can just, on your own, you can go down the road of what photography means for memories and how people loosely just talk about photography as being something that allows you to capture and hold memories. But very rarely do we talk about the fact that, well, digital files require hard drives to hold them in. And They require, I guess, cloud storage for people to hold them in. But that becomes completely ephemeral when it's in the cloud. And when it's in a hard drive, you have to hope that the hard drive technology isn't so antiquated that you can't plug that into your computer. And all of that digital recording and digital memory ser serving is very similar to what it was like with film and what often happens to film archives and film photographs. With the exception of a major archive taking over a set of photographs, most people's film and prints get relegated to boxes which go into storage or eventually they just wind up in flea markets or thrift shops or they get destroyed. And there's a pretty healthy business of people trading in decent prints and uh, silver gelatin prints and um, historical um, dark room uh, uh, you know, prints, tintypes, um, daguerreotypes, other kinds of like antiquated processes which are relished now they're sort of savored and collected now because they are so rare what I'm trying to get at is that that each sort of technological advancement of photography essentially attempts to uh, you know to claim that it is permanent and we have found over and over again that it's not. All of that is to say in one very long-winded package that making a picture of an object that is temporary is a pastime of many photographers. The idea that you can assemble all of these things into the frame, photograph it, and you have, you have it for posterity. Even the photographs of Tony's sculptures that are on the website, and I can, uh, I can bring those up again. Even the photographs of the sculptures on Tony's website attempt to capture these objects as they are now, as a document of what they are now, in some definitive way. The presentation of these works at the gallery is also a sort of effort to definitively show his work so that it can be experienced by more people, by
by people again anew. But I'm getting ahead of myself because ultimately what is so fascinating about Tony's work and where all of my interest is divergently heading is that to be a photographer and to take objects that are ephemeral, things that essentially could be considered trash, that might be considered trash, that might ultimately, you know, um, be, uh, uh, you know, being thrown away. Um, to assemble them in front of the camera so that you can make something that feels visceral, that feels magical, that feels magnetic. And that is what pulls people towards the photograph. I mean, that is the essence of making a solid photograph is to, is to, to, to make it in such a way that it has an aura, which is either based on the technique or based on the content or ideally based on a combination of the content and the technique together. These pictures of, of uh, Tony's sculptures, particularly these two cardboard box sculptures, are special because the images of these really speak to the simplicity of the object. When I say simplicity, what I'm talking about is the basic materials. This is a cardboard box. This piece is from 1986. So this is a cardboard box, probably from roughly 86, 85, 84. Maybe it was knocking around in his studio for a little while. But he's taken the time to pierce the two surfaces of the box with needles so that he could thread through these holes, some, some thread, some sewing thread. And in doing so, he's created this kind of grid, this vortex, which helps describe the space of the box. Another artist, Solowit maybe, um, would paint a pattern within a room in order to help define the architecture of it. And the process of that would become much more monumental. You can see here at the top, you can see the thread that's going through the uh, that's going through the uh, the cardboard. So it sort of goes in, it threads up, and it comes back down. I just keep thinking about Tony sitting with this box in his hand on a table, piercing the cardboard with a needle, running the thread through the holes. Was the radio playing when it was happening? Was it quiet in the room that he was making this in? This piece is sort of one of the more labor intensive pieces, to be honest, because it required this sort of handiwork. Here's another one of the cardboard box pieces. This was also in the show at Gordon Robichaux. show. And this is even smaller. This is four and a half inches by uh, four and a half inches by four and a quarter inches. Also from 1986. And in this case, it's pieces of cardboard that are taped together. And then there's uh, some watercolor paper around the sides and in the back. Here, let's see these. In this case, it's not a box. Like, it's not a prefab box, but it's four pieces of cardboard that create that cube. And of course, again, the process of him piercing the sides of the cardboard at equidistant points in order to push the thread through and create this vortex or this grid. I just couldn't help but continue to think about the person sitting there making these things. 
when I look at a painting and, you know, maybe this has to do with my own personal experience, but I don't think about the artist painting it. If I'm lucky, I look at the painting and I, I think about the marks that are being made and, and maybe the marks of that painting are present and they're meant to be looked at. And so that's part of the experience of seeing the artwork. Or maybe the artworks are more photorealistic. Maybe the paintings are more photorealistic. And, and in that sense, I'm just sort of drawn into being in awe of the seamlessness of the painting, or I'm just taken in by the narrative um, content of the image. But I'm not thinking about the, the painter sitting in front of the easel or sitting in front of the canvas applying the paint. And even, even with photographs, I'm not thinking about the photographer, really, I'm not thinking about the photographer making their work although I push myself to get into that space, but it's only certain photographers that I'm really trying to break down the mechanics of what they're doing. But with these, with these, with these objects that Tony's made, you know, I just couldn't, I couldn't help but think about the time and the delicate nature of making these works and the meditative qualities around it. I'm going to show you a couple other pieces in the show. Um, this one's a little more unusual because the format that it's being exhibited is a bit different than, than, than maybe it had been in the past, but these are 37 objects that were collected in a glass jar with a metal screw lid, you can see this is, uh, or that's how they're that's how they're defined. And you know the jar is six inches by three by three inches. In this case, the gallery has decided to sort of exhibit these in a grid. And again, the quotidian nature of these objects becomes very clear. What brings these together remains a mystery, but ultimately, the answer is simply the artist and within that we gain a snapshot of those sort of childlike interests in objects when I say childlike I mean like the youthful engagement with the world the way that all small objects can be special and feel special but it's really something like this this one that's called Magnolia from 1992 and it's simply a can and knives and this, this particular object speaks to me because I have in the past photographed knives in a similar way. <clears throat> and maybe this is the point of connection for me, is that I have, I have thought about how to photograph something like this, something that has a lot of power to it, an object that has a lot of intentional power to it and meaning. And, you know, these are kitchen knives, but there's so much rich, powerful meaning behind this sharpened metal. Historically, um, so sociologically, um, but also here we have you know, two different forms of metal. This can that's been pressed into this form and these knives, which, you know, have been filed down or honed. The fact that the handles are all hidden from view, it does suggest a bouquet. And the idea that, these, that this piece is called Magnolia has that kind of poetry to it. Um, take a look at it again here. So here it is from another angle. As a photographer, I might attempt to to capture this in a way that the the documentation has, um, you know. Again, here we've got a white background. We've got the object in place. It's a clean, sharp image that shows in detail what the object is. It's no replacement for the object itself, of course. And 
in someone else's hands, in Irving Penn's hands, for instance, this would look different as a photograph. But it doesn't need to have heightened drama as it would in a photograph like that. Again, what's special about this is its ephemerality and its quotidian nature. It's unlikely that we would store knives in our own kitchen facing this way up, but it's not unlikely that this group of objects could be present altogether in someone's home. So let's look at a couple other images. This sort of leads me to the next point that, that seems important to this work and that also seems really poignant to me in this moment as I'm looking at this show. And maybe also, um, you know, in terms of in terms of pride um, being today, um, so this is a this is another piece. It's from 1992. It's untitled. The materials that make it up are aluminum foil and 57 glass marbles. Here it is from another angle. Here it is from another angle. So Tony Fair, and I hope I'm pronouncing his last name right, F-E-H-E-R, died in 2016. There's just something really connected about what it means to be accepted in the world and what it means to make art that is celebrated in the world especially art that is by all by all means of valuation this art is so difficult to put a price on it's so hard to convince people especially we're talking about work that was made in the late 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s. Um, I wish I could just say this in the simplest of terms, but uh, you know, we live in a society where it's so difficult for people that somehow occupy space outside of the basic norms, mostly Christian norms in our culture, and it's very difficult for 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 people that, that are outside of that to be like fully accepted and you know we have consistent upheaval decade after decade for people who want to be and rightfully so they want to take place in the society that we have created and you know pride is so much about acceptance of all um, but it's particularly about LGBTQ community. And Tony was a part of that. And here he is making these sculptures that are, that basically kind of defy what the art world wants to see as art and what the art world wants to to kind of value as art. These are some more shots of the website. Um, this, this was a nice installation photograph here. Um, but you know, this is two pieces of wood that are painted blue. I'm just breaking these down in terms of the materials they are. Obviously they are way more than just what the materials are, but this is a glass jar with a few marbles in it. Here's the box we talked about. You can see it in relationship to another glass jar. These objects are small. They're on a small shelf. Here's the other box we discussed and the aluminum uh, sort of tray with marbles on it. So the point that I wanted to make that I'm, I'm trying to get around to, or one of the points I'm trying to get around to, is that 
it is it is with the assistance of the gallery or the museum or the exhibition space or in some cases the collector it is with the assistance of these entities these sort of cultural entities that this work is platformed what separates this box from simply a craft that somebody made in their home and an artwork that resonates with all of the meaning and importance that I'm trying to stumble into discussing is both the person who made the work and their experience in the world their awareness of artwork their their understanding of the objects their understanding of of how these materials can be elevated with the right amount of attention the galleries and museums they're doing the same thing they're recognizing that by by providing the right amount of attention and space for these objects which the or for the artist the right amount of attention and space for the artist and these objects get to continue living even though they are totally ephemeral even though they are essentially degrading they're they're falling apart and disintegrating how much longer will the tape on the side of that box really last at what point does the amount of archiving um, or uh, fixing of the object change the object from what it was into something else maybe it continues the artwork perhaps but it is really ultimately that sort of quotidian material that is being elevated by the generous attention of a singular artist and then the continuing um, generous attention of galleries like this one and museums that have given Tony shows over the years. People, people need to be believed in sometimes just because they are people. And I'm not saying that all objects and artworks need to be believed in, but these do. These continue to resonate, and I'm so happy that I was able to get there to see this show today. And I could probably go on for quite a, a bit longer about how photography intersects with this and and what what good can come from that or how immobile the photographs can be ultimately I think like the photographs can sadly lack the same resonance as the objects do and that is a that is a sort of failure of photography only because people desire photography to do the opposite of it yeah well i hope all of this recorded maybe i'll make more all right see you later